we're going to get right into the games. Kai, I'm just going to get it going. First one, we're going in chronological order based on tip times as West Virginia and Maryland. West Virginia looking at about a two and a half point favorite right now over the Terps. Kai, we talked about how Maryland is, is maybe getting a, another Mark Turgeon here who struggled to win in March. Is that going to be the case again with Mr. Willard? I, I fondly recall betting against them last year and yeah. Seton Hall getting absolutely demolished. Yeah, um, I would say West Virginia comes in playing the better ball right now. Um, although I, I did do some filtering on Bart Torvik. Uh, he makes this game a pick since February 1st. So you could say these teams are pretty much equal since since February, which, okay, I, I guess I buy. From a sheer physicality standpoint, Matt, I think it's West Virginia. But Maryland is a very old team. They are tough in their own right. I just think West Virginia has a big advantage on the glass. Maryland plays without fouling, which is key. You can't really let this team shoot 20 or 30 free throws. You're going to lose. Who has the better guards? I think it's probably Maryland, but who has the better coach? Emphatically, it's Bob Huggins. I'm actually pretty on the fence here from a spread perspective. Two and a half, I think, is a pretty fair line. I'm leaning towards West West Virginia. I probably will put a bet on West Virginia eventually, but right now I'm sitting on my hands. Uh, The current number, I don't have a strong opinion. I mean, this is one of the few games I got bet up over a point and a half on the the opener, up to two and a half right now with, uh, with the ears there. I don't know, Jimmy. West for you know, or Maryland, excuse me, not the biggest team, but they are pretty good defending the rim. Um, you know, I'm not sure they're the great, the best post defense team, but they are, I think, more capable of standing up to West Virginia's size and brute force up front than people might realize. Um, it's not all that different of a team than what we saw last season, right? More of like a positionless team that gang rebounds without you know traditional positions with you know forwards and and guards. Could give Westfall some problems. I just liked what I saw from Westfall in the tournament. Um, so I, I do lean that way, but this is no bargain if you're looking to lay it. I think you missed your chance to get the best number. Well, I didn't. I took two, man. Ah, so sharp. How about that? Uh, yeah. Sharp. I, I, I like West Virginia as well. Kai, you mentioned filtering our, our pal Bart Torvik site. If you filter for away and neutral games, hmm. Maryland falls to like 59th, or excuse me, 49th. West Virginia is still a top 20 team. I think that's more indicative of, of how I perceive these squads. Maryland not playing in College Park, not quite the same. Uh, maybe there's a chance Maryland lives at the free throw line because that's what West Virginia does. They they foul a ton defensively, and Maryland can make free throws with their solid guards. But I just generally like the Huggins angle. I like that they are better uh, away from home. I trust them more. The one thing is, Kai, is this Eric Stevenson's final revenge on me where I bet on him and he goes <laughs> over 15. Oh, Jim, he's going for 30. He's going for 30 for sure. If I, oh, if I bet 30. on him, you think he's actually going to score? Uh, yeah, yeah, Jim, he's this is the redemption story for you and Eric. It's going to be a handshake agreement. I love it. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I need it. Give it to me, Eric. All right, next game up, Virginia and Furman. Matthew, I'll go to you here. The Cavs, the Woos, the Wahoos, the Hoos, laying five against the Paladins. Seemingly a decent matchup here for Furman, not a team that's going to batter them in the paint. Different version of Virginia with no Bennett Vanderplas. They do play a little bigger with Shedrick and Caffaro. What do you think? Right. The question is, are they going to weaponize those guys on offense? They don't really do that. It's more of like a defensive ploy, I think, by uh, by Tony Bennett. I think it actually works against them in this matchup mm-hmm. because that's where Furman can make you pay with their inverted offense, with the way they can bring Sloss now to the perimeter. Uh, I also think Furman's found some real staying power with the role players uh, with how good JP Pegas has been down the stretch, just a great shot making guard. Um, and they got Ben Vanderwall, who's like kind of this unsung hero come off the bench, just makes stuff happen, flies around, gets offensive rebounds, does the dirty work. I just think they need a little bit more. They, that was their issue all year. They didn't have enough of that. It was too much loss in Bothwell um, and Foster to a lesser extent. I think they're getting enough from the role guys now where you're going to need that. in a game against Virginia, if you're going to pull off an upset, right? You can't just ride star power the whole way. Um, and I like the Dens. It's just the fate of Virginia, Kai. They're not that good. I'm saying it all year. I have to stick that. Um, I guess stick to my script on that one. So go Dens. It's a shame we didn't get the Ben Vanderplas versus Ben Vanderwall match. I know that everybody wanted. I agree. Uh, this is the match that Furman wanted, in my opinion. Virginia is not crazy athletic. Furman really struggles against those type of teams. You saw the NC State 19 point loss earlier this season. Uh, I think they kind of get chewed up by athleticism. And you said it, Virginia's pack line can conducive to forcing opponents to shoot. So Furman wants to do. They do lead the country in two point field goal percentage, but they have plenty of knockdown shooters and they attempt threes at a top 15 rate. Bob Ritchie is data ball, baby. He likes three versus or three versus twos, right? Smart basketball. Senior point guard in, in Bothwell. I look for that in the tournament. 
That's key. Fantastic coach and Bob Ritchie. Of course, Tony Bennett's no slouch. This is Ritchie's first tournament. Maybe that plays into it a little bit. Maybe Tony Bennett ends up running circles around him. Who knows? Virginia is the oldest team in the field, Jim. They're experienced. Kia Clark was on the Final Four team, for crying out loud. Um, and Furman's defense isn't great. I'm a little bit worried about that. Virginia's offense, certainly not a, a world beater by any stretch. And no BVP is, is huge. Um, but that is my only worry in this one. At five and a half, I do lean towards Furman. I, I have submitted that as a bet, Jim. Yeah, I, I thought this was actually a little low. I, I'm mm-hmm. surprised. Just yes, in yeah. my head, I thought maybe I, we'd get seven or something. Like Ohio, a couple of years ago, I believe, was getting seven against this Virginia team. Ended up winning outright. Very popular pick. I'm sure Furman is going to be as well. Uh, Kai, you mentioned the the blowout loss to NC State. They also played Penn State, who is much more in the vein of not crazy athletic, more of a finesse team. And Furman lost by five. They were able to hang around in that game the whole way. Matt, I don't love the number, but I, I definitely do lean Furman here. Am I crazy for thinking that it's it's low? I know Ken Palm has it five. I just I kind of thought Virginia would be laying more. It, so I looked at what was the Ohio spread, Jim, that Virginia closed. I think we had the same like narrative. Seven or eight. But, yeah, seven. Okay, I thought it was closer to seven, but you're right. I think this Furman team's better than that Ohio team, actually. Um, hmm. and this Virginia team's a little worse than that Virginia team. So I think if you just kind of look at that, that's an easy comedian way to handicap it. But just from that lens, um, because that was the same thought I had. A lot of these games, I think we'll talk about very short spreads, but it's just indicative of how good the 12 13 line is. So yeah, yeah I, and I've I've made the case on Twitter how much I, I think Virginia is better when Shedrick plays and, and like every on off mm-hmm. number that's paints that what picture. we're seeing now, right? And their fans kind of resisted that idea. They said he's a he, all he does is commit fouls, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I, I think he's a stout defender, and now I have to bet against the version that I said is better. It's not super exciting, but I, Furman, I, I like especially that it's at five and a half rather than five, like getting that that extra potential win. Right. All right. Next up, Mizzou, Utah State. Kai, we got to do it. We got to talk our Tigers. They are playing yeah. early in the day out in Sacramento. Show the shirt. Show the shirt. Come on, yeah. baby. Let's go. Fight for old Mizzou. <laughs> Oh, man. But trying to handicap this, Kai, there are some interesting angles. Maybe I'll let you get to them first. What are you thinking here? It's a Mountain West team in the tournament. They have struggled mightily this, actually, not just this year, the past five years or so. What are your thoughts on this this game, our alma mater? The market is on the move, and I agree with the market. I grabbed plus two and a half Mizzou. It's down to one, fellas. That's right. Money Ooh, coming out of the Tigers. This morning. Oh. It just did. Literally just changed. Yeah. Tug of war. Last time it was Utah State, now it's Mizzou. The barely toss. They opened two, two and a half. Come on. Come on. Uh, concern. Mizzou has not won a tournament game since 2010. Mike Anderson. Yeah, it's been 13 years. Crazy. Uh, that does not factor into this game. Just a crazy stat, in my opinion. Uh, completely opposite resumes. Mizzou, awesome resume from a schedule, from a um, actually performance perspective. Terrible predictive metrics. Utah State, weak resume, awesome predictive metrics. Hence, Utah State is favored in this game. Ken Palm made him a favorite. Top 20 in the country. I don't buy that. They have not beaten or played a team from a power conference all season except for Washington State. Every single big win they had was in the Mountain West. All were at home or in the Mountain West tournament when they beat Boise State. Should be a lot of points. Both teams like to shoot threes, play at a high pace. But Matt, I think Mizzou trumps Utah State in athleticism, quickness. I think they're going to cause issues with turnovers. Utah State doesn't play through the post. They don't have a dominant post scorer. They don't even have a great offensive rebounding team. That's huge against Mizzou. It's Mizzou for me, even at plus one. I think they win this game. I disagree. I think Utah State's front line is pretty good. I mean, Trevian Doris was the best player on the floor for them against a vaunted San Diego State Aztec front line. Seven foot one guy, a guy who I think has had potential since he started at Utah State. Um, I'm sorry, started under the Craig Smith era, stayed the course there, and now is, I think, starting to become a real role player for them. And then Dan Aachen, I love just like an athletic bounty rim runner. Uh, I think they have more size and more, they're a more complete roster than it seems like people are discussing. And I think the analytic um, form of this team is, I mean, look at Bart Torvik's last 10 games, Utah state minus eight, just based on the last 10 games alone, right? Last five, it's Utah state minus 10. Now I know a lot of that's baked in the, you know, some of the home road splits you talk about playing the mountain West, beating average teams by huge margins, where Mizzou has had average teams, right? I mean, Mizzou's beaten a lot of bad teams in the non-con, but they let those teams kind of hang around, and it kind of prevented Mizzou from climbing the analytic charts. You could argue in a tournament game against a like-minded opponent, that's where the analytic skew kind of gets normalized or balances back out in Mizzou's favor. I still like this Utah State team a lot, and I remember vividly watching a Ryan Odom coach team pull off history 
on TV one at Beard Park, while TV two to the right was uh, a Mizzou second half um, meltdown against Florida State. So I don't know, just yeah. some weird, weird deja vu in my mind, Jim. That's where I'm yeah. at there. I mentioned both teams like to shoot threes. Well, one team gives up a ton of threes. That's Mizzou. That's the yep. scary thing. You give up a lot of open threes too because they gamble. Mr. Hodge is a terrific defensive swiper, but he does gamble, and then sometimes that gets exposed on the back end. If you give up open threes to Utah State, good night. Like that team is an elite, elite shooting squad, uh, basically from four of the five positions. Taylor Funk is is a sniper. If he's going to get able to to launch. 10 to 12 threes in this one. That's really, really concerning. Now, hey, one for eight is last game, Jim. One for eight. He's cold. Oh, he's cold. Good. So he's do theory. Huh? How about that? Um, Matt, you mentioned Akin and, and Dorius. I don't think those guys can guard Kobe Brown. He's too mobile no, for both of fair. them. He can bully Funk. He can bully Bearstow. He's going to have a big game in this one unless Odom is able to scheme him out some way, but I, I don't anticipate that happening. So there's actual edges for Mizzou there. Uh, with with Kobe Brown and then starting to draw double teams, that's how you get open threes. I'm just too scared of the the amount of open shots that Utah State's going to get against this defense. That's that's what scares me. They take care of the ball well enough that Mizzou's probably not going to feed off turnovers. So I'm going to sit this one out, Kai, at least officially. While I'm at Beer Park, I'm going to be betting on Mizzou. Of course. Who, who, who how, am I kidding? How about over? I'm not how about over? Recommend it. Yeah, why, why can't both teams score? I I, I think they will, right? I mean, Kobe yes. Brown could have 40 in this game. Like, if it's just Akin, he's Kobe Brown one-on-one, I mean, Kobe will just go to work. So, yeah, I like a lot of points here. Uh, total sitting at 154, 155 in the market. It is 162 at Ken Palm to tell you where, how much there is a downshift for postseason play. And yeah, right. playing a little slower lately, which is part of it. But I see efficiency, efficiency, efficiency in this game. All right, uh, Kai, we don't have a spread yet for Alabama versus Southeast Missouri State or Corpus Christi. There's a chance it's higher than 21 and a half because of how good the tide are playing. Boat race. I think either way. Rolls. Boat race. Yes. yes. Yep. Absolutely. Both teams play too fast. It's going to be a crush. Yeah. Yep. That's the problem. Matt, you agree? Kind of a yeah. kind of universal. I was trying to find the, uh, I feel like we've said this every year about the playing game winner. Like we just auto bet the team that they're going to play. And I was a little worried that maybe we've been foolish in that angle. So I'm trying to dig up the data on that. But yes, off the top of the had no question. It's an absolute run. I know. I know. Wright State got rolled by Arizona last year. They might have covered though. They lost Did by they? seventeen. That was like a oh, weird yeah, like backdoor like thing. Cover. Yeah. Yeah. First half, cover. Arizona was up big. I think. Yeah. Okay. I can see that being a decent angle there as well. Alabama right. first half. Uh, I, the travel isn't awesome. You got to go from Dayton to I believe Birmingham. That's where this game is being played. Yeah. We'll see. All right. Next up, Arizona and Princeton. Nope. San Diego State, Charleston. Jim, come on, read the outline. Stay dialed in. Come on. Stay dialed. Come on, baby. Uh, Mention the Mountain West stuff with, with Utah State. They are 0-9 against the spread in their last nine games. This conference as a whole, last 50, 14 and 35 with one push. Like It, it is a long-running trend of struggles for this tur- this conference in the tournament. Now we've got San Diego State laying five against Charleston. Matt, the CAA has actually been sneaky good. 22 and 11 in the big dance against the spread. They have lost three in a row. So it's not a, a super hot recent trend, but where are you looking here? Charleston, maybe a, a team that wants to run San Diego state more going to dominate you in the half court. What are you looking at? And I feel like a hypocrite. I was saying the Aztecs were a team I was looking to back for a deep run and they looked pretty impressive in the mountain West tournament. I know they um, fended off some uh, very desperate efforts from capable teams um, and I guess maybe got lucky to catch Utah State, who was stone cold from three in that title game. I still think it's a really complete team with a little more upside than the usual Aztecs have. All of that said, my best bet is Charleston. Um, a big reason why this is a West Coast to East Coast travel. Uh, the Aztecs will be playing at noon at local time out there in Orlando. Um, kind of got screwed with this draw. I mean, to win that tournament and the conference, you sweep both, and then they have to travel east to play a team that's uh, that's red hot in Charleston, who stays in their own same time zone pat kelsey um can coach we've seen him play yes. really well in this dog setting before i know dutcher is a great coach too but um you know charleston the one thing we talked about with the offensive rebounding even though people look at the mid majors who can offensive rebound and think they can't replicate that against the big boys i actually think they can that's why a lot of the giant killer formulas pop for teams like charleston who can shoot threes and create exposition on the offensive glass it's more about effort than it is like size mm-hmm. or physicality right it's like we want to go to the glass versus we don't 
Um, and I think that angle actually will play well against the Aztecs, who are a good defense or good rebounding team, but not invincible on that end. So I like yeah. Charleston. I mean, I like them a lot in my best bet. Yeah, I, I love both teams. It kind of sucks they're playing each other, to be honest. Um, but it's not a bad draw for Charleston, though. They needed to avoid a team with an explosive offense that would welcome a fast-paced game and play a lot of possessions. That's not San Diego State. Their offense is definitely better than in the past, but they still prefer a half-court game. They aren't a Bama or an Iowa or a Gonzaga. Three-point looks will be there for Charleston. Ironically, they've shot very poorly from deep, but they have shooters, and they do like to let it fly. They're top 10 in the country in three-point attempt rate. San Diego State, 280th in three-point three attempt rate allowed, tend to pack it in more. Charleston's very deep. Just about every single player also has a giant chip on his shoulder, which I love in a tournament setting. They're basically a con- constant underdog mindset, a lot of energy. But San Diego State's experienced. They're also deep. It's it's kind of a toss-up when it comes to uh, who wants it more, Jim, I, I'll say. Charleston's defense, to Matt's point, with the giant killer thing, it's no joke. I think they're going to make this a pretty tough game. We saw them beat Virginia Tech and Kent State in the non-conference. They beat Colorado State by 10. They hung with UNC. I think they can win this game. I do lean their way, Jim, at plus five and a half right now. Yeah, five and a half. That's what we're getting, Matt, his his best mm-hmm. bet price there. Love having that, that hook, I'm sure. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I, I'm very split on the side here. I, I think it's actually an okay matchup for San Diego State, too. I was worried about them getting Drake or, or maybe a, a different, uh, potentially an Oral Roberts one would have spooked me big time uh, for, for the San Diego State team. But Charleston, like you said, Kai, not actually the elite shooting team that we've seen. Yeah, The angle I like a lot here is the under. Uh, I, I think Charleston has actually proven to be a bit of a pace taker. Uh, they, they've played some really yeah. slow games against teams that will play slow. And San Diego State has has hit the brakes since league play started. They they ran a lot in the non-con and then slowed it way down in, in Mountain West play, played three slow games in the Mountain West tournament. Their defense is really, really stout, best one in, in that conference. So I, I, I like the under. I think this game ends up playing a lot slower than Charleston wants. And hopefully, Matt, for you, that helps the underdog. Less possessions for yeah. that uh, sample size to bear out. So I'm probably not going to bet the side. Uh, unless I do something live, I've said all season Charleston is a live betting team. Get in one way or the other. Might might do something with that once the game starts, but pre flop only going to go with the under. I'll say this: if the Aztecs are smart, they should look to push because you're going to get a team that's looking to crash the glass. You get easy looks in transition if you want to run here, but don't. I, if you're Dutcher, I wouldn't pigeonhole yourself to the half court. I, I think that's where you get in trouble. All right, next up, as I alluded to earlier, Arizona-Princeton. Finally going to get to this one, the 2 versus 15 matchup. Princeton uh, also kind of escaped from the Ivy. We're able to get a, a big one there. They are getting 14, 14 and a half right now at Bet Rivers is the spread. Kai, feels like Arizona can smash in the paint here with their dominant front court duo. Princeton has a decent paint presence, but they're just not the same size, caliber mm-hmm. of the athlete that Arizona has. And Princeton's defense doesn't scare me in terms of the point guard shortcomings that Arizona has. So what, what, yeah. what do you think of this game? Yeah, Ivy teams tend to give power squads trouble in the dance. I don't have stats to back that up, but it's because they play really smart. And their offense, the Princeton offense, is very difficult to prepare for, especially if you haven't seen a lot of it. So I actually wouldn't be surprised if Princeton hung tough in the first half here um, before Arizona kind of makes adjustments in the second. This is also the by far the best teams Prin- Princeton has played all season. They played at Hofstra team that ranks 90 in Kempom. Other than that, it's Yale. That's basically it. A little bit worried about that. Matt Princeton does have a lot of versatile size. It's not Arizona's size, but it's something. But if Tosan gets in foul trouble, Princeton's best player, they're screwed without him. Um, I, I like that he can pull Ballo or Tubelis away from the rim in the little Princeton offense, facilitate, initiate from the top of the key. But if he gets in foul trouble, they're done. Zona has too much talent. Again, I think Princeton can hang for a bit, and maybe the angle is Princeton first half here. But Zona has a pretty strong track record of decimating inferior competition this season. And I think they just might do it again. Yeah, I'm looking at last uh, since 2005 per Bet Labs, Ivy is 11 and 10 against the spread, but 1.75 okay. cover margin. So I think that's more indicative of what you're saying. Yep. Maybe some bad variants there swung against the actual record. But um, yeah, I think the nuance of what the ID schools run tends to be somewhat of a uh, it's tough to solve for the coaches outside of the league. They don't know it as well as the coaches inside the league. Um, maybe first half Princeton, if you really want to get involved yeah, here with the dog, I mean, but I just think it's, it's, it's yeah, that's what I'm thinking. It's yeah. men versus boys though. And that, that's what I worry about. Like over the course of 40 minutes, like I know Tosan's kind of a physical specimen. He actually looks like a Pac-12 player, but no one else in this roster. Um, I mean, it's just, it, it's a categorically different, beast here that's my concern if you're a princeton backer nothing for me officially though 
Yeah, I'm I'm starting to like that that first half angle as well. It, the, the also interesting thing is you you perceive oh the Ivy Rep's going to have a bunch of lethal shooters in that offense. It's not really Princeton. They don't have yeah. a ton of dominant perimeter players. They don't take that many threes. Uh, Matt Alaco is the one who's really come on strong, but uh, it's not like a dotting the perimeter with a bunch of guys you have to stay glued to. I, I do think it feels like the kind of thing where Arizona will wear them down, extend to the second half. I know we bet Purdue last year against Yale and it it did take the the size some time to really smash Mm -hmm. that interior. But uh, I I think we see something similar again here. I just don't love fading Arizona in the, in the favorite spot. And Jim, who can forget? Oh, God. God. Pen to first fifth, pen first 15, 16 seed against Kansas, baby. That hit the Ivies. They come out strong. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's, that's probably another good look there is, is uh, first 15 because of, I think go ahead, Matt. Like the Princeton, sorry, the Princeton and Charleston thing, it just hit me. I think we'd agree they're better shooting teams than how they've shot this year, which makes them impressive because they've had success despite not shooting the lights out. Right? They've kind of found other ways to score um, inside the arcs. So I kind of think it gives them upside as like a, you know, a team that's looking to pull off a giant killer. Yeah, I mean, they they play mostly through bigs. Kelman and, and Woman are like their two highest yeah. used players by far. It's not it's not some sort of perimeter barrage. You see Santa Barbara versus Baylor. Kai, I know you've mm. been sort of the Babs believer all season. Um, yeah, Babs boy. Similar narrative here. You know, talent is very, very legitimate here from the 14 seed line. Definitely a more talented team we're used to seeing from this type of seed. Um, Baylor, obviously one of the best shot making teams in the country, but can they defend? I think is what this ultimately comes down to, especially up front against a, a pretty vaunted, I would say, uh, Gaucho front line. Yeah, this team's a 12 or a 13 any other year, basically. Um, this spread's gone up actually in favor of Baylor. It's up to 11. It was 10 uh, most of this morning. Many expected Santa Barbara to be a top 100, top 75 team even this season. Their talent is nuts. AJ Mitchell, Pierre Louis, among the better backcourts nationally at the mid major level. Same with Norris and Kelly up front in, in the front court. I do think there's a big coaching edge here for Scott Drew uh, over Pasternak and putting it lightly. Um, it's also the best team by far Santa Barbara has faced. It's the only top 100 opponent they've faced outside of UC Irvine, who ranks 99th. Um, but this team is big and strong. They're not your typical mid-major. They have power size. They have power players. Uh, Baylor's offense is awesome. They're going to carve up Santa Barbara, who is not the most disciplined team in the world defensively. I just think it might be kind of a shock for for Barbara to step up in competition um, like this against Baylor. I do kind of lean towards Baylor, Jim, but I do think it's a dangerous 14 seed, and 11 is getting kind of high. Yeah, and Baylor has lost to a 14 seed before. We saw yep. it happen with Georgia State. Um, this team, this Baylor team, is much better offensively than that one was. They can attack in a lot of different ways here. But I've mentioned all the season, I, I don't like how frequently Baylor switches with their small guards. And if you're going to have smaller guys getting on to A.J. Mitchell, Pierre-Louis, even playing through Andre Kelly or Miles Norris in the post, uh, that is a problem. Uh, that's That's how the Baylor interior defense has been exposed over and over really really bad two point percentage defense like just got smashed in that department in uh, in league play really they finished 10th in the big 12 in both two point percentage offense and defense and i think santa barbara actually has the the horses to maybe exploit that so again man i'm leaning towards the dog i just do fear the three point shooting outpouring that could happen with baylor that really really elite shooting team with those guards yep no i agree um yeah we'll see at big west i'm not sure if i i don't think i have any good data on how well that conference has stacked up in the tournament, um, but it seems to be usually full of teams that people sleep on, just like no one really sees them play akin to the Pac-12. Um, yeah, there's real talent, but I don't know if they can stack up with Baylor's offensive firepower. Creighton, NC State. Kai, where did Creighton, NC State rank on your uh, most boring slash most exciting first-round matchups? It feels like this one's been not discussed as much, even though there are some pretty fascinating um, yeah, being you know, stylistic bit, angles. Yeah. Here. Okay, yeah, I think no one's really talked about it. I think Creighton has kind of fallen under the radar. They mm-hmm. feel like a real dark Maybe. horse. They haven't played well down the stretch, kind of why they fell lower on the seed line and why people aren't taking them as seriously. I think maybe a you know, month ago, we'd probably be like, oh, this is, you know, kind of like how people talk about TCU, right? You know, two six mm-hmm. seeds with really, really high upside, haven't all the way been at their best all season. Um, and NC State sneaks in, right? Another ACC team, bubble uh, benefiter who can really shoot it, really space it. What's your take here? Yeah, Creighton laying, laying five here. Um, under, underseeded when you look at analytics. Creighton um, and a team in NC state that had a real case to miss the dance entirely. I kind of think NC state is in trouble. Um, They've had a lot of success this year playing through DJ Burns on the block and he's a beast, 
but it's very hard for me to see him getting anything easy against Kalkbrenner. He has the weight, but Kalk is just such an elite shot blocker, elite length, defends without fouling. Uh, and the perimeter defense for Creighton is excellent. They're quick. They have long guards. They can harass Terquavian and Jarkel Joyner. They take away the three ball. They force teams to get into the mid-range or go against Kalkbrenner. And on the other end, Creighton really takes care of the ball. They can get stagnant in the half court for sure, but I think having a guy like Baylor, Baylor Shireman this year in the tournament is going to be a real game, game changer. I lean towards Creighton right now, Jim, at minus five. I love Creighton here. I, I think they are a better Clemson, and Clemson absolutely smashed this NC State team three times. Uh, the, the physicality in the paint is similar, and they're not going to get totally worked by NC State's guards. Like they've, they've got actual bigger guards that can defend on the perimeter there. And I don't like that NC State can't move Kalkbrenner around. Like That's what Villanova did to – uh, did to this Creighton team and and moved him and and then you don't have the rim protector around because Eric Dixon's knocking down threes but DJ Burns can't do that he, he's going to be in the paint they don't really have a floor stretching option at the five um, so I, I don't like how that sets up for them I'll be back in Creighton here Matthias uh, one little note Greg McDermott one of the strongest under coaches in the NCAA tournament mm-hmm. uh, it's like 24 and 13 when he plays uh, to the under so if you're interested in that, obviously it's kind of a high number, but if we think Creighton's defense is going to lock up those guards, then then perhaps uh, tempo gets limited enough and, and that could be a, a decent under angle. Yeah, Jim, I think that reason right there, uh, the matchup similarity between Clemson and um, and Creighton is why I'm not backing NC State, because I thought this was a very interesting stat. Bet Labs, since 2007, teams who lost their last game before the tournament by 20 or more points are 21 and 12 against the number in the tournament. So... Whether that's just like a like an extra motivational psychological juice, or the market overreacts to a really terrible last effort, um, I don't know. That's a pretty strong trend. I don't know if I'd go against that. I'd say, but 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 the, the matchup similarity as you mentioned, uh, maybe there's a real reason for that just to repeat itself, and it did three times against Clemson this season. So, 